Oh, welcome back to Sunday Science, everyone. Glad uh, you could be here to join us today. Should be a good, fascinating show today as we start getting into, uh, well, we're going to start with masers because that's where it began and move our way into lasers after that. Uh, again, glad you could all be with us today. Uh, sorry about last week missing the show. The other stuff got in the way and we just missed the show. I apologize for that, but shouldn't be a regular thing, so no worries. <clears throat> uh, so, masers and lasers. I'm sure a lot of people, uh, well, everyone knows about lasers. They're fascinating. They're fantastic little contraptions, and the majority of our world wouldn't actually work the way it works without both lasers and masers. And uh, with that in mind... Uh, let's go ahead and jump back in time a little ways into the 1950s uh, when Charles Hardtowns at Columbia University in New York actually first came up with the concept of a microwave amplification by simulated emission radiation and actually started building this. And this actually traces back to work Einstein had done prior, but was never actually produced into a, any kind of a working model. So in the 50s, finally, Towns was able to actually sit down and start building this. And he was able to do that with uh, Herbert Zeiger. And, uh, yeah, he was, one of, he was a grad student, and so was James Gordon, working with him at the time. And they were able to come up with the first ammonia-based maser and it was entirely operated off of Einstein's predictions. And uh, the th one of the cool things with masers that people don't realize is that they're still in use today. It's still a means of communication on satellites, and it's still a means of using radio telescopes to their full potential. So they're not, they're not just some relic that led into the development of the laser. They're still an actively used piece of technology. And... It, well, like with so many other things going back into the space race and the early ages of a lot of this stuff starting to come out and come forth, it's truly amazing technology that we're still using today. And, of course, we built upon it, made things better, made things more efficient, as we always do. But to think that without this simple idea of a maser, we wouldn't have satellite communication the way that we do. <laughs> Can you imagine GPS not working? I don't want to. <laughs> I can imagine GPS not working. It would just be really, really, really terrible. Especially for people that will not stop and read maps. I mean, for one, I, I love maps. Uh, you know, growing up with a geologist for a father, it's, reading a map's like reading a book to me. It's just fun. But... <laughs> I am glad that GPS satellites do work the way that they work and that we still communicate with technology from the 50s. It just keeps getting better. Uh, so originally, what was it? Uh, it was late 50s. I can't remember exactly when. 56, maybe 57. Uh, Towns finally actually started coming up with a way of creating an optical laser as opposed to a microwave maser. And I believe his uh, first development actually was something found in a sketchbook by uh, Jack Gould. No, not Jack Gould, sorry, Gordon Gould. And he kind of he kind of ran with Towns' idea for an actual optical laser that would be different from a microwave maser, obviously. And they started getting into a bit of a quarrel over it. And at the end of the, in 1959, actually the first application for a patent was fired by, filed by Gould. And I believe his patent was actually denied, but uh, Town's patent was actually approved under the work at Bell Labs. And this kind of started a 30-year fight between the two, even though Gould was, again, I believe Towns' 
one of Towns's grad students, and he basically kind of stole the idea. Uh, unfortunately, eventually it wound up that Gould wound Gould did wind up receiving the patent in the long run after years of testing and coming up with different ways of doing solid state lasers, which uh, <clears throat> the actual very first that was produced, uh, what was that? It wasn't at Bell Labs. Uh, it was at another research laboratory where the first actual optical laser was constructed out of uh, synthetic ruby being your lasing medium and as aluminum oxides uh, not that difficult to grow producing synthetic rubies is incredibly easy so if you destroy a bunch of them it's really no big deal if you're trying to dig them out of the ground and use natural ones you're not going to have any luck so <laughs> it's a good thing aluminum oxide is incredibly easy to grow in the lab uh, I'm not sure what any of the size of that that actual first ruby laser was. I don't. I, mean, I know some stuff. I don't know everything. I'm just like anybody else. But I know that it was uh, fairly small and fairly minuscule as far as power output. Nothing compared to a laser pointer used today in a classroom or you know by someone who doesn't think certain things are spherical, but we don't need to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are so many things with certain people and their uh, failed understanding of optics that I always want to get into, but I'm trying to avoid it. Good idea. <laughs> <sighs> but, yeah, anywho, I, it, was, it was synthetic rubies that were used for the original lasers, and you had a solid silver coated end and a partially silver coated end so that when your actual laser pump source which uh, the laser pump effectively is how it is that you're initially exciting any sort of you know you're actually getting the electrons excited so that you can have photon emission through whatever your medium is different lasers obviously use different sources with the with the first actual sources, it was of all things, and it makes perfect sense. I would try and do it this way too. The flash bulbs from a camera, and you can imagine that's a quite an energetic pro process back in the fifties, as their flash bulb was an actual one-time use <laughs> flash bulb, not a not a little light that turns on on your camera anymore to get rid of some red eye. It was. It was quite a source of energy back then. Oh yeah, this also don't put your hands in front of those. You will burn yourself. <laughs> oh, horribly. <laughs> uh, no, you honestly if, you, if anybody remember the old Polaroid cameras where you put the flash bulbs where you plug the flash bulbs in on the top and then watch and then after you've taken your picture you can just look at it. You look at the bulb and you see the glass is mostly melted. Yeah. I actually <laughs> still own one of those. With the, you with still the cubes. Own one of those. With the cubes. I do. I, 90 degrees. I've been thinking about trying to learn how to actually produce my own film because you can't buy the film packets, and obviously, anymore. But mm. I do still actually own a Polaroid. I, oh, I would have to run to out to my uh, display case and grab it. But I'm, I'm going to say good luck and leave it in the display case. It is a museum piece now. Well, half my house is a museum piece. <laughs> well, you should see my office. I've got a whole bunch of these same pieces here. Most of them are gaming consoles, funnily enough. Hmm. <laughs> no lasers. <They're> cool. <laughs> uh, so, where in the world were we? Oh, yeah. So, Ruby lasers. Obviously, short... <laughs> short life cycle as the laser pump system was not continuous. It was just a burst and we were able to, well, not we, but the people involved were able to rectify a, a concentrated beam of photons only operating at one wavelength. And it started some pretty phenomenal stuff as far as technological development goes. Uh, like I said earlier, I know everybody knows what lasers are. Everybody has seen a laser pointer, played with lasers. I 
have my dogs chase a laser pointer around the backyard all the damn time. It's the funniest thing in the world. I'm sure a lot of people do it with their cats as well. And my wife's cat absolutely adores the red dot. Yeah, my dogs <laughs> yeah. don't care about the red dot, but they chase the green dot. They love it. Uh, yeah, well, that's because which is a little scary because of course I have to are are are, are uh, don't do well with red lip with red wavelengths. My sister in law's dogs, however. Uh, one of them is a Jack Russell Terrier, and he goes absolutely batshit over it. Mm. Yeah. Well, the dog. Beagle will ignore it completely. The Jack Russell Terrier, he's yes, on that. He, he, he's on that like swimwear. But dogs, dogs will enjoy that as fun that they can either choose to engage in or not. Cats, however, got to be careful. They can't resist any small, rapidly moving object. They are cats come pre-programmed to chase them until they run out of breath and fall over sideways. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, I know. Anyway. The sad part of it is, you could, the sad part of it is, is that you could actually lure a cat into violating its usual, pro, its usual thought process in, re, in reference to persons or things. I actually got, I actually got my, I got my wife's cat into trouble a couple of days ago with one of those things. I, 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 I dropped the laser on the wife's chair while she wasn't in it because I'm crazy and I'm not stupid. Uh-huh. Uh, and the cat was and the cat was trying to climb the back of the chair to get to the laser and <laughs> oh the wife came back in ass. So oh yeah. This she did thought not the cat well. was trying to claw the crap out of the chair. I see. Oh man. And she realized what I was up to it. I got yelled at. Of course, <laughs> of course. All right. Well, she told me I couldn't do it, but the cat was too well trained. No, the cat's not well trained. It's not that well trained. No, you, you can't. You can't overcome the natural built-in programming of cats. Small thing, catch, kill. Uh, <laughs> Andy. Okay, Ruby lasers. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> yes, with Ruby lasers uh, finally getting on way again with the uh, short beam. Short life cycle. Of course, improvements had to be made, and they were made, uh, I believe, the exact same year, actually, was when the first helium, nas- helium neon laser. That was generate, early the year after, I believe. Uh, continuous beam, finally. And, mm. oh, who was it? I know I, I've I actually met this guy before, and I should remember his name because I had the awesome ability to meet him. Or at least one of them. I know that there was more people involved, of course, but uh, I want to say William Bennett. Hmm. I think it was. I think it was William Bennett, but I actually had the luxury of meeting him when I was little. I met quite a few people that did some awesome stuff, thanks to what my dad did for a living, and that just happened to be one of them. Hmm. But. Uh, that was the basically the introduction to gas lasers was almost immediately after the entire concept was even fathomed, and I just I love how incredibly fast this technology was. Everyone jumped on it. It wasn't like one person sitting in a lab going, "Well, I really hope I can figure out some sort of supersymmetry," and then thirty years later, suddenly people went, "Oh, we should join in on this," and eh, never mind didn't work anyways <laughs> hey there might be an ability to do this and it seems as though half of half the research facilities in north america and half the research facilities in moscow all jumped on it simultaneously hmm. everyone wanted the technology and uh, no i don't think they wanted to make star wars blasters but i'm sure that there was a lot of funding going to that portion of it as well <laughs> Oh yeah, you don't oh, even know, dude. Indeed. <laughs> it's uh. Ooh, it's Anybody weird. remember the Star Wars project from Yonks ago? Uh huh. Oh, indeed. Yes, the allegedly inactive program. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, sorry, I'm getting. I'm just Mr. sorry. That's just just throw a little conspiracy in there, you know. <laughs> Mister Mister Ragan was never able to get get his hands on the amount of funding that he needed to make that work. The DOD went, uh, yeah, hey, you guys, you Congress critters, you Congress critter things, yeah, you might want to rein in your boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, 
And oh, hey, uh, there was a oh, I think we skipped over a very brief period in, in history when the um, the um, uh, we, you covered the the destructive uh, the self-destructive lasers with the with the uh, single flash. Between that and the first gas, there was the um, xenon the xenon flash tube style for a very brief period before the yeah, gas for about six became, weeks. Yeah, before they became pi, <laughs> and it was it was it was coiled around the thing. And it's same thing, same thing used in a camera. <laughs> but that was, hey, uh, that was that if was memory good. serves me, that was also right around the time where uh, fiber optics were actually first being proposed. Indeed, and uh, very very weak fiber optics. Maybe transmit something about twenty feet, but look at where hey, it got us today. Twenty feet is better than no feet. Yeah, so fi fiber optics has advanced quite a bit, but. Uh, Indeed, and laser technology had a lot to play in that, actually. Hmm. Indeed. Huh. Well, without laser technology, fiber optics doesn't work. At all. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. You could do this You could do this with raw light, but you don't want to. And for a number of reasons. Maintaining uh, coherence would trying. be a pain in the ass. Um, the idea behind a laser, of course, is that the light is, in fact, coherent. It Indeed. does, in fact, have it does, in fact, have something resembling physicality. <laughs> Indeed. And yes, I know that wasn't the word I was looking for. It was the one that it was the one that dropped out. <laughs> okay, I was trying to fit that word into the. It's okay, maybe it's just beyond my understanding. So it wasn't. It does. Act, it does act. It can actually have a a significant physical effect beyond what you would think of as light generally. You can focus a laser and do some real damage to a thing rather than just kind of light it up and just warm it overall. I agree. I think that's where I was going with that. <laughs> okay. You can't actually you can't actually burn things with, with a powerful enough laser. It's hilarious. <laughs> oh, there's there's a multitude of lasers I've worked with in industry that a uh, little bit more than burn stuff. Mm. Y'all, there were Quite a few things, There are a few things that yes, we'll just flat poke, we'll just flat blow holes and shit oh, at long some, ranges. And again, more, it's all a question. It's all a question of power. And more useful. It's an excellent cutting instrument. Uh, okay. It is incredibly precise. In fact, one of the one of the lasers invented immediately after the very first uh, gas laser was produced was actually the. Uh, Yttrium aluminum garnet laser, which is still in use today in almost every single engraving machine on the planet. Yes, I don't actually. There's a couple CO2 laser engraving machines, but those are a lot more powerful. Generally used for cutting material as opposed to engraving. And there's actually a company here in town, not very far from me, that is one of the largest manufacturers of YAG laser engraving machines. It's pretty awesome to head up i've gone to their facility once on a tour it's pretty awesome and you and, and when you do that you have a minimal loss of material hmm. the remaining material can be recycled it can be recycled very rapidly and you lose almost almost nothing in the process oh yeah with a lot of laser engraving especially you know let's say uh your dog's name tag, since that's a pretty common one that a lot of people will run into at PetSmart where, oh, hey, I buy this tag, I punch in what I want, I stick it in the machine and watch it happen. Woo, it's cool. <laughs> All you're doing is going through the anodic coating, which, again, thank you to uh, it being so easy to grow aluminum oxide, the anodic coating on aluminum, for anyone that doesn't know, is aluminum oxide as well. It's the same thing as sapphire and ruby, just made in a lab. And the the whole anodic coating thing actually brings us into another type of laser that, since I already brought it up with the CO2 laser being used for cutting machines, it operates in a very similar fashion of having a cathode and anode actually being your primary uh, laser pump for the entire piece of equipment. It's DC powered, just like you would do with a an anodizing tank working with aluminum and you have a CO2 gas chamber for, you know, your exciter. And now all of a sudden, instead of cutting a little bit through a top coating and making a dog tag, you're 
burning holes through inch thick steel plate. It's a good <laughs> idea. The, those are some awesome lasers. Wow. <laughs> when it comes to industrial laser cutting, that's that's a level of power that is incredibly scary to watch when it's you know when you when you if you're cutting something that's thin, a thin piece of sheet metal, it it kind of resembles a plasma cutter, you don't think a whole lot about it, but when you get the large scale industrial laser cutters and you're watching a CO2 laser actually shred through an inch thick steel plate. That's awesome. That is an awesome amount of power. And it's not exactly new technology. It's been around surprisingly quite a while. I think the, uh, oh, when in the world was the first CO2 laser made? I want to say it was in the 70s, but um, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. So I want I, I, my, my little brain wants to say 75, 76. Thereabouts. I'd have to look, I'd have to look it up, but I think you're correct. It's somewhere in the mid seventies. Yeah, I I think it was. It was around the same time that the first free electron laser was made. But we're skipping a little bit of, too far ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, you really you do realize that that is your fault in its entirety. We're correct. Well, of course, I have a tendency to meander and. Just talk. jump around and have a, ha, have a grand old time. Nobody's faulting you for it. <laughs> In fact, we, ra we rather enjoy it. How'd you guys enjoy? <laughs> uh, well, one, of the, one of the big highlights that we missed jumping into the 70s out of the 60s was uh, actually when uh, Towns, uh, oh, I believe it was uh, two other people of Russian ancestry. I can't remember their names. Uh, pro uh, I'm no good when it comes to Russian. You would think I would be. I was taught it as a child because, you know, Cold War, all that good jazz, and I'm still terrible at it. But, anywho, <laughs> the uh, first Nobel Prize in physics was actually awarded in 1964. Two towns and uh, two other physicists, uh, for their work in coming up with the maser and which obviously as stated earlier led into the laser so that was that, that's a pretty huge highlight in my opinion that a whopping 10 years after sitting down and thinking i can make this one of the first nobel prizes was awarded when oftentimes there's 20 30 years between starting a piece of work and a nobel laureate actually receiving their Nobel Prize. It's or just ask Mr. Einstein to tell you all about it. <laughs> he will tell you all about that shit. Indeed. He started, his, he started his work in the late 1800s, and I don't believe he got his uh, his Nobel Prize until the 1920s. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's just Mr. Einstein. <laughs> you know, it's it's not something they just like to hand out to any. Jack, Jill, and Joe. Well, unless, of course, you happen to be with Barack Obama and a Peace Prize. Hmm. Yeah. Politics are so unscientific. It, it certainly seems that way. Well, I, if we're being honest, pol politics is generally pretty vile anyway. It's its own it's its own batch of problems. It is. And I'm sure that you could get lasers involved in politics real fast, but I don't think we need to. Well, actually, we've been involved in politics almost from the beginning. That's just the way it's been. Oh, well. So we had, we had started talking about fiber optics, which actually was, again, same thing in the 60s. Uh, who was it? George Hockman? Uh, that's the name I remember. I'm trying to look it up again real quick. <clears throat> Charles Cow and George Hockman actually working together uh, the uh, standard telecommunication labs in England uh, started making their first breakthroughs actually in fiber optics due to, hey, lasers, we can actually send signals through, gra through glass pretty well. We didn't have very good glass back then, though. It had a lot of contaminants in it. It just, you couldn't send a signal very far, and we still didn't actually have a means of necessarily receiving that signal, but we were getting to where 
this is actually a thing that's going to be able to happen. And uh, this is, again, where it goes to show normally it's a lifetime of work that gets you a Nobel. Cow actually received a Nobel in 2009 in physics for developing fiber optics in the 60s. So that, go that definitely goes to show just the amount of time it actually takes to for most people to get anywhere near. Well, you have to you have to wait you have to wait the queue. <laughs> <laughs> There's a queue for this. You have to wait. There is. So uh, at this point in time, I think maybe we should go ahead and uh, oh, side strike. Would you like to? Sure. Would you like to share that little video that sure. we were thinking about? Sure, here we go. Let me present so you guys are watching in, in real time. If or if you want to inject anything, let me uh, get some yes, inject, going. Injection is fun. Here you go. Although what form it will take, we don't know yet. We'll see. <laughs> All right, let's get back over here. All righty. And here is your requested video, Andy. Let me know how the audio is when, he's, when they start speaking. Hi, I am your new Fern Photon. Most people are familiar with electrons and electronics. Similarly, we photons enable a whole field called photonics, the science of light. I'm going to talk to you a little about light, optical fibers, and the development of optical fiber lasers. Photons can be portrayed as either particles or waves mathematically, but for our purposes, we will use a hybrid. Also, in my presentation, some technical terms will be in italics. This way, you'll know they might have external references. For instance, wavelength, represented by the lowercase Greek symbol lambda. In the optical spectrum, wavelength refers to the color of light. Blue is a shorter wavelength, around 400 nanometers and red is a Pause. longer wavelength, around okay. 700 nanometers. Now, when he says that there might be external references to some of this stuff, there are external references, and we firmly we firmly encourage you to go look at them. <laughs> I would totally agree. You should do this. Don't take my word for it. Don't take his word for it. Definitely don't take Andy's word for it. Go look at it. The evidence is out there. Go check it out. Seriously. Okay, carry on. Carrying on. Light, of course, extends through a far greater spectrum than the human eye can see, from X-rays through to terahertz radiation. Most optical systems operate from the UV through to the infrared. Optical fibers became possible with the practical understanding of Snell's law. Light transitioning between transparent materials bends in proportion to the change in its velocity. Like a rod in a beaker appears bent at the air-water interface. The ratio of the velocity difference is the refractive index. In optics, we add materials called dopants into glass to change the refractive index. By putting two pieces of glass with different refractive indices adjacent to each other, we can emulate the bent rod effect. Imagine that a glass rod with a high refractive index core surrounded by a low refractive index cladding would guide light continuously down its axis. Well, that's exactly what happens. And we can also change the effective angle at which light is accepted by adjusting the refractive index of the two glasses. This is called the numerical aperture. High numerical aperture means broad angles of acceptance. If the core size is large so that multiple wavelengths of light or modes can enter by a variety of angles and can propagate down the core, the core is considered to be multimoded. If the core size is small enough to only allow the passage of one wavelength at a specific injection angle, the core region is considered to be single mode. Depending on the size of the glass rod, the refractive index, and the wavelength, the core can be both single or multi-moded. We strive for single mode. So, we generate certain wavelengths and use glass rods with diameters in the micrometers, less than two human hairs in diameter, small enough to be greatly flexible and resilient. Fibers. Fibers usually have one core and one cladding along with a protective coating. 
Most are made of quartz glass because of its purity. We use standardized nomenclature to specify the relative sizes of the core to the cladding. For example, 10125 represents a single mode fiber with a core of 10 micrometers in diameter and a cladding of 125 micrometers. A 105 micrometer core with a 125 uh, micrometer cladding is rep. Okay. Okay. Just for the just for reference, if you say the word micrometer to an engineer or a physicist, you will you will you will receive a tool. <laughs> Typically, they refer to the uh, the distance that he he's referring to as a micrometer as a micron. This is a word that you will be more familiar with. Thank Indeed. you. Okay. Good clarification. Presented by 105-125. Even though we know we can send light down a fiber, there are many variables that come into play. Fiber type, core size, numerical aperture, refractive index, and doping all contribute to expand the range and possibilities of light propagation. However, we strive for single mode, remember? Launching light down a single mode fiber is difficult and the light source is expensive. How can we strike a balance between power, efficiency, and economy? Through experimentation, it was discovered that changing the refractive index periodically along the length of the fiber could make the fiber reflect light. This creates a grating that takes advantage of Bragg's law to create a type of mirror. By changing the intensity and period of the grating, the amount of reflection for particular wavelengths can also be controlled. This quickly led to the development of a fiber laser, a fiber laser works by reflecting light through an optical cavity so that the stream of photons stimulates atoms that store and release light energy at useful wavelengths. On the periodic chart, these elements appear in the lanthanide series. Iterbium is the most common lasing atom. Eli Schnitzer, a pioneer in optical fibers, learned to dope the core of an optical fiber with iterbium to control the refractive index and photon absorption. Practically speaking, the ytterbium atoms have an absorption curve that looks like this. A broader spectrum of light can be absorbed at the shorter 915 nanometer wavelength, and a more efficient absorption can occur at the slightly longer but narrower 976 nanometer wavelength. The photon absorbed by the ytterbium dopant disappears, and electrons whizzing around the atomic nucleus move to higher orbitals on account of the absorbed energy. This process is called pumping to indicate that energy is being injected into and stored by the atoms in the fiber. Within about a millisecond, the electrons, otherwise unstimulated, drop to their original or ground state and emit a photon at a wavelength of 1064 nanometers. The energy efficiency of this absorption and re-emission is known as the quantum efficiency, and it is simply the ratio of the pump over the emission wavelength. It's impossible to get a higher optical efficiency than this number. With its close pump and lasing wavelengths, ytterbium can be made to laze with astounding optical efficiency. Pump, store, emit over and over again is a realistic oversimplification of the process. To maximize the coordination of the pumping and emission, an ingenious fiber optical cavity, sometimes called a resonator, is constructed. At the pump end of the cavity, a high reflector made using a fiber brag grating is spliced to a fiber that is doped with ytterbium atoms. At the output end, a similar fiber brag grating with a modest reflectivity of around 10% is installed. Thus, a very simple monolithic single-mode laser device is created. Monolithic in fiber terminology means that once the light is in the fiber, it stays in the fiber, end to end. However, the length of the doped fiber is important as it determines how much of the pump light is absorbed. We use the term absorption length for the combination of length with the amount of doping. Typically, a fiber laser has an absorption length of about 95% of the pump energy. This is to avoid having a section of unpumped fiber in the laser cavity. An unpumped section inevitably charges itself and self-lases, resulting in a failed fiber. To pump this device, an optical laser diode can be installed on the pump end. Because such a laser is single mode, its power is limited to the output of a single mode pump diode times the quantum efficiency of the laser. Single mode pump Paused. diodes are expensive and relatively paused. So uh, one of the ones that we will get into hopefully later, if time permits, uh, single diode lasers are actually a member of the semiconductor laser family. That well, they let us listen to music, they let us watch movies, they do all sorts of cool stuff for us. Just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. <laughs>
They entertain Jaren. Oh, whoops. I'm sorry. I, Ooh. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> and I apologize to all. Okay, continuing. Oh, there's, there's, a, there's a little bit more here. Uh, there is actually the, the the point. Of, the other the other half of that is that you are with a diode laser. You are actually restricted to a very low power output. Extremely uh, low power output. Yes, we're talking about you know tenths of watts. Uh, typical voltage. The typical breakover voltage for a diode is 0. 0.7 volts. So anything you're working with has to operate within that bound. Hmm. Indeed, I'm pretty sure that's all the semiconductor lasers live in the class one family of lasers. They're, you, you, you almost cannot hurt yourself in any way, shape, or form with a class one laser. You are correct because we do not actually have because we don't actually have the ability we don't have the ability to put enough power in it. You can nope. you can construct most class one lasers operate on uh, operate somewhere in the one uh, in the point seven to one point two volt radio range and not to exceed one point five volts, mostly right down near point seven and have a general current class less than 100 milliamps. Hmm. Awesome. All righty. You, you can ask me how I know that. I'll even tell you. <laughs> dare, dare, we, dare we ask Andy? I think we need to. Okay. How do you know that, I, squirrel? I started. I started. I started. I started my Navy career as an electronics technician. I did a lot of work with that kind of thing. Oh, there you a go. A lot of it. <laughs> Very cool. All righty. Uh, right. Continue, Andy? Yeah, let's keep All going. Right. Here we go. Low Carry power. Far, to achieve higher power, either more pumps need to get connected to a fiber, or the fiber will need to get much fatter. In fact, over time, both came to be. It was discovered that light, once guided by the core, continues to propagate for a significant distance even when the core is tapered until it is essentially gone. The light can then be recaptured by a new core that intersects the light path. This path is called the evanescent field. By extending this concept, it was discovered that multiple fibers can feed into or split out of one evanescent field, leading to the development of a fused biconic coupler. There are limits to this phenomenon, however. The brightness, defined by the core area multiplied by the numerical aperture, must be conserved. For example, a coupler can be made with two input fibers of a 100 micrometer core diameter and a numerical aperture of 0.12 and an output of 100 micrometers with a numerical aperture of 0.24. If we now change our laser by adding the new found coupler to the front end, we can see that the laser power can be doubled. Unfortunately, practical limits quickly set in when we try to add a third diode for a tripling effect since each input would require a pump diode with a very small numerical aperture and ultra-high brightness. These diodes have a matching ultra-high price, not practical at all. More economical high-power pump diodes have a larger numerical aperture and a larger diameter output fiber. Using these economical pumps requires the use of double-clad fibers. The invention of double-clad fibers enabled very high-power fiber lasers with good manufacturing economy, great electrical efficiency, and astoundingly high brightness. In principle, a double-clad laser fiber works the same way as the conventional fiber we just described. However, the double-clad fiber is larger in diameter and has a second pump cladding with a very high numerical aperture. Now, even conserving brightness, this will allow a coupler with six legs at 0.22 numerical aperture each. Pumps of up to 600 watts per leg are commercially and competitively available for this coupler. This is encouraging. Once the laser is assembled as before and we apply pump power to the diodes, we quickly see that much of the pump light simply passes down the cladding without intersecting successfully with a dopant ion in the core. Without this intersection and transfer of power, the laser cannot work. The solution to this problem is to create extra reflecting facets on the outside of the first cladding. Schnitzer, remember him, found that changing the shape causes enough redistribution of the light in the cladding to force a high level of interaction with the core. Now we have created another situation, too much light. As power in the laser goes up beyond a few hundred watts, photons in the core start to behave differently, much like surging traffic on a congested highway. 
nonlinear effects start to appear, such as Brillian scattering and Raman scattering. The solution is the same as on a highway. We add more lanes. For fiber, it means increasing the diameter of the core. This obviously reduces the light intensity quickly because the core area increases with the square of the radius, so a doubling of the diameter quadruples the light carrying capacity. And, with this increase of core diameter comes the loss of the single mode beam quality that makes fiber lasers so effective. What to do? We've determined that the acceptance angle in the fiber is dependent on the refractive index difference between the core and the cladding. Dov Kleiner and Jeff Koplow found that bending the fiber also affects how the core accepts light. They also recognized that the single mode, or the fundamental mode, propagates down the fiber with a slightly lower numerical aperture than any of the higher modes. The combination of a low numerical aperture in the core and a bend in the fiber allow the higher modes to escape, leaving the fundamental mode in the core. The evanescent field of the single mode beam expands to fill the core diameter, avoiding nonlinear effects. Best of all, the amount of energy from the core that escapes as a higher mode is minimal. Serious, extremely high beam quality fiber lasers were now possible. Laser technology has evolved over the past half century. The power to cut and weld and do amazing things with directed energy has spread to all parts of the globe. Many refinements are still being developed. Advances have also been made in using laser fibers for specialized telecommunications, scientific, industrial, and directed energy applications. Lower power diodes can create and manipulate seed signals, often as pulses. However, the signal can attenuate over distance, which requires amplification. To do this, we need to modify our 6 to 1 coupler into a 6 plus 1 to 1 coupler and send a seed signal directly into the core of the fiber. With this configuration, we can eliminate the Bragg reflectors and simply stimulate the laser emission with a seed signal of our choice, an avalanche rather than a resonance effect. However, Realize that a residual pump power totaling about 5% is quite significant with a fiber laser operating at one or more kilowatts. This valueless power could cause all manner of safety and engineering problems in beam delivery systems. So, additional Pause. components such as residual pump... Pause. Pause. Just to let you know... Echo. All right, try now. Okay, just to let you know, one kilowatt is rather a lot. You could easily injure yourself to a very large degree if you are using one of these. If you are using one of these lasers, you will at least burn yourself even with a, even with a short exposure, and with a long enough exposure, you could probably remove a finger or something, some other similar sized object. Oh. Okay. Be aware, powers of that ra powers in that range, not something to be screwed with. You get megawatts, you can take out, you can take, you can take out a joint in a large joint, no less, in no time flat. Mm. <laughs> Needless to say, getting that much power behind the laser gets a little on the spendy side. Okay, yeah. it gets a lot on the spendy side. They've been working, on, they've been working on that. They've been working on using those. To using megawatt level lasers to cut ship hulls at long distances. <laughs> hmm. Moving on. Okay, moving on. Important safety tip. Here we go. Pump strippers are added to the very output end of the fiber. The stripper has a higher refractive index than the nominal cladding on the fiber. This then catches the high numerical aperture light remaining from the pump and releases it out of the fiber as lost thermal energy. Further refinements such as sophisticated electronic feedback and control mechanisms are still in development. So you see, creating a viable high-powered laser is a result of intense research and finely tuned techniques. We sincerely hope that this introduction was useful and informative. For more information, the parts to build your own laser, an educational kit, or one of our many complete industrial, scientific, or defense-oriented lasers, please give us a call or find us on the web. Cheers. Because we must end the video on a plug. <laughs> Andy, did you get product placement for that? <laughs> I did not, but Andy, I figure if we're going to use somebody's, somebody else's work, we might as well let them plug themselves and get the benefit. Of course, I agree. Certainly or at least not feel like we played them for idiots.
Indeed. Well, yeah, I would right. hate to cut out the last 15 seconds of their video just to be, oh, no, I just don't want be... them to. No, of course they should absolutely get the credit they deserve. Absolutely. And uh... I thought it was a great video. I wanted to help inspire people to maybe look at going out and learning more about this technology, maybe even build one yourself as opposed to taking apart an old Blu-ray player or an old DVD player. Do it the right way. Go through a company, go through professionals, and learn. Well, you, you, you can learn old, by tinkering. Don't get me wrong. I, I learn by tinkering with a lot of stuff. But there are certain things, and lasers happen to be one of them, learn first tinker later I you can hurt that. yourself and I you can hurt other people it's i mean even just a couple of weeks ago i accidentally wound up lazing someone completely by accident she was blind for a good 20 minutes hmm. it makes you feel terrible when you screw up like that and i would hate for anybody to make a mistake like that let alone take anything away from a show like this and go, hey, I'm going to go tear a bunch of Blu-ray players apart and try and build a laser and then blind my dog permanently. That, that'd be terrible. I, Actually, I everybody do us all a favor. Don't, me a, don't mention this if you do decide to do something that's stupid. Uh, and B, tearing apart a bunch of Blu-ray players is probably not the best plan. No, semiconductor lasers are not going to provide what it is that you want from a research experiment. You'd have better luck focusing LEDs. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you're, 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 and you're, you're a good warning with the, uh, with, with the safety, because the, the, the engineering involved in, in the safety goes beyond the device itself. You have to account for things external to the re reflection, un unplanned oh, far reflection. Beyond. That and you, even uh, if you do successfully, let's say you do sit down and you make your own, you know, homemade laser pointer or anything of that nature, even just using a store-bought laser, you can get yourself into a fair amount of safety issues. They're not, I know that sometimes people present them as being toys because you're playing with them with your cat or your dog. And I even said earlier, I play with my dogs with the laser, but imagine driving down the highway and accidentally being lazed. Oh. The, also, whatever you do, do not point these things up the first time. You, the first time, something because they are very easily tracked. You find one of those on an aircraft by mistake, and you will have every every piece of authority in the neighborhood, and some of them on national levels down your ass. And I don't care what country you're from. And well, what keep you it, have keep it on the ground, keep it indoors. There's no reason to go and play with lasers outside. It, you can get in a lot of trouble and you can do serious damage. They're just a general safety net warning. Yeah. Do recognize yourself. their power, recognize what it is that they are. So they're a lot of it's fun good. to do experiments with, but they're, they're, they're not a toy. They are a scientific apparatus and they should be treated as such. This actually, this actually gets worse, believe it or not, because if you shine one of those in somebody's window, you can be held accountable for either for depending on what kind of a mood to cop the local cops in, uh, and the person that you're dealing with, you could be charged from any with anything from a a niggling misdemeanor, which will net you a fifty dollar fine, all the way up to and including suspected terrorist acts. Okay. <laughs> Do not play. Right. Another another important FYI. Very good. So, side and I find it difficult to believe that uh, shining a laser through your neighbor's window could in any way be described as research. So, <laughs> indeed, I agree. That would not be research. That indeed. would be you scaring the crap out of your neighbor, and therefore being charged with a minimum simple assault. Indeed. Yeah. Keep the laser in your basement. Go get a fog machine. It'll be plenty fun. Open the windows. Have an exhaust fan. Do all the things. Be safe. But there are there are a lot of fun experiments you can do, and you know, I, we're history wise, we're not even barely breaking into the seventies yet, and we're about coming up on our normal hour long show. So, 
I was wondering if uh, anyone in the comments, anyone watching might have any questions they would be interested in seeing if we could field or anything Ooh. to that nature as we still have another 35 years of history i think sorry 45 years of history i think this might actually entail a double episode Ooh, that should that would be fun i would because there's that. a lot it's of really equipment well. there's a lot of scientific equipment attached to this that getting into laser spectrometers <clears throat> and just laser spectroscopy as a whole particle accelerators I, yeah i think this might be a uh a multi-episode venture, as opposed to let's try and cram it all out in one shot. I, I didn't think you were going to get it into one shot. How about a question? Oh, we got one. We got one. It's more of a, yeah, uh, let's see, G-Hammer. So laser guns would be a beam instead of a shot like movies tell us. Yes, quite accurate. You would be correct. Indeed. It's, it's, uh... Uh, in fact, a particle beam weapon would be something a, a bit different. You would actually have you would actually have a charge of gas that you would excite with the light. Hmm. Indeed. Let's see. Any anybody have any other questions? Uh, Bring it. Bring it on, folks. <laughs> yes, this is a super secret behind. agent laser chess. I don't know how in the world you would actually play that, Sean. Uh, you know what? We could we could set up the rules for that. It wouldn't be that hard. <laughs> hmm. I think that would have to be at minimum a 4D chessboard because I'm sitting here directly in front of my chessboard, and I'm thinking a laser would just scorch it. Well, it depends on the laser. Indeed. It really would depend on the laser. Hey, well, back, back to that video, uh, just, just before we get too yeah. far from it. Um, even understanding the technology involved, which I, there's no question that you do, Andy, but even understanding the technology was not, I mean, watching what they described in, in that video was, it, it, it's still, uh, watching it, I found it, I found it amazing to watch. Even though the technology is involved in lasers, we do understand how they work, why they work, how they were first made. Um, I, I found that just frighteningly interesting. It's like what we used to use for just uh, carrying uh, beams emitted from a laser is now part of the process. And uh, I was very impressed by that. That was, that was an excellent choice you made there. You know, fiber lasers are one of those ones that they make... Well, they make 21st century existence possible, and actually, uh, going back again to the 70s, I think some of the first fiber optic cables were laid in the 70s for telecommunication purposes. And it's not something that people think about as, as much as they do, uh, okay, I can cut stuff with a laser, I'm going to go have laser hair removal, I'm going to you know, buy this laser cut, uh, model and I'm going to go and put it together at home. You know, when I look at, when I look at the television in my living room, I don't, the first thing I think about is definitely not the fact that there is a semiconductor laser shooting through a fiber optic cable, a signal from one apparatus to my surround sound receiver. It's almost like, you're right, it's almost like the perfect utility. It's like you don't have to think of how many times the pistons in your car engine are firing. It's merely used as a tool to get where you need to go. It's the same as exactly. what I described. You don't need to think about it. It performs the needed task for, for, for decades without failure. <laughs> and, and, right. you don't have to, and you don't have to think about it. Well, at but, least mostly. Hmm. You do actually have to worry about them a little bit, but yeah, you don't have to worry about how often how, how often your spark plugs fire per minute, just to get an idea of whether or not it can take you down to the shops. Somebody's got to ask: How do I trap my <laughs> laser in a cylindrical volume for my lightsaber? You don't. Well, you, that's at this point, we uh, don't if actually, a functional don't, lightsaber would be. It would be best made from uh, some sort of source that would emit a extremely high temperature plasma hmm. as opposed to some sort of electromagnetic Actual radiation. Laser. Yeah, EM, EM radiation is very poorly suited for that sort of thing. You would actually be looking for a plasma blade. Yes. Yeah, so, and that would be a large pain in the ass. Which, yeah, a plasma which, blade, it, I think the lightsaber is horribly misnomered for what it would actually be because 
if you have, if you, let's say you have a handle emitting photons like a laser pointer, you would have to have such an intense amount of energy coming out of that to actually function the way the lightsaber functions. You might actually be killing people in space. You'd probably kill yourself. <laughs> you would be irradiated so quickly it would be a completely useless tool. So the lightsaber is really more of a plasma saber. And even you then, want a controlled, you keep that away from your face very concentrated or any other plasma. object. And that would actually get you to be to what the Star Wars lightsaber is. Is it would have to be a plasma saber. And we'd need a serious confinement uh, uh, confinement field of some sort because. Well, you would use a you would use mag a magnetic. Yeah. You would use a magnetic collimator of some sort for that. Uh, mm -hmm. A but magnetic how, bottle is probably the only way you could you could even remotely safely handle that amount of plasma, and, and even and, then you would wind up turning yourself into in, into a cookpot. And if you didn't, if yeah, you, you didn't, you'd probably remember, sunburn the crap out of yourself the second that you ever tried to turn it on. Remember well, that in the movies, well, they could impact things. Of course, you don't things. turn into a fucking cinder. They would because. In the movie, well, so I am assuming that you survived things, the is, process. Otherwise, there's no point. What density would you have to achieve to have? let's say two beams or one beam and an object be able to impact something and not have it merely interrupt and, or pass through it and get heated. Remember in the movies, when you hit two beams together, it's like whacking two broomsticks together. Indeed. Which doesn't work. No, you would need uh, to, you'd need to seriously you would, compress your plasma. It, no, yeah, no, the no, energy actually, density necessary for a lightsaber to be a functional sword is quite it, high. But it, when, you're talking about, when you're talking about one lightsaber colliding with another one, you're actually not colliding with the plasma itself, but the magnetic bottles that the uh, that they're uh, contained with. Mm. Because it, one would if, actually repel the other. One would hope that there are ugh, magnetic fields of uh, dissimilar charge, otherwise... Well, you what you would wind you would up never actually it. wind up getting your lightsaber to contact another lightsaber. You would just kind of turn them on and get sh launched into space away from each other. <laughs> well, here's what would actually happen. What you would what what you would do is you would get the the uh, you would actually have the same charge towards the outside of the blade. Like charges repel each other. Mm. That's the way it works, and that would prove that would not only provide. Um, that would not only provide the ability to parry with a lightsaber, mm. but it would also not. It would also disrupt uh, any kind of electromagnetic anything that any electronics in the neighborhood. Done, toast. Mm. They'd be dead. So uh, and then the plasma connects and rips open and, and rips open <laughs> flesh and bone and just <laughs> destroys anything you got going on. All right, so you're saying no, uh, cons no consumer model this year, you're saying? No consumer model, lightsaber. Not, not a chance. No, <laughs> not this that year. That will not, not happen. <laughs> we do not actually, funnily enough, we do not actually have the technology to make this work just yet. Just <laughs> However, I yeah, was saying they are working on some more things. Actually containing energies of that level, I think we're going to have to do a little bit more research before we get there. I mean, I, a little? I'm not About entirely, a lot. I'm not entirely sure mm -hmm. lightsabers are at the top of... Uh, top of the research pyramid at the moment but no they're not but uh, but for, unfortunately for a lot of people they would have military uses if you hmm. could make it work which we can't it has actually it, i will be honest with you it has been attempted and the only time they managed to make it work it was actually room size okay <laughs> it was room size and it required a hell of a lot of energy is this another one of those things that if we ask you if you tell us how you know that you have to kill us um, no, not really. It was okay. a uh, it was a research project from the 1980s. Okay. Somebody got a wild hair up their ass after watching Return of the Jedi and said, "We should try that." And the the best they could do was a large warehouse <laughs> to actually get a beam to work. And even then, they lost power after about uh, what? Oh, it's like 50 or 60 milliseconds. <laughs> okay. and it, it was not oh, useful in any way to perform. Admit, and but, admittedly, a warehouse is difficult to carry on one's belt. All right. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Indeed. And, Sean, I agree. You are absolutely right that the magnetic field would need to be effectively monopolar, and that's just not something that exists mm. as we can produce or know. So I completely agree with you, Sean.
Well, what they did with Very the warehouse comment. size, what they did with the warehouse size object is they buried the other pole in the body of in in the in the body of the object rather than uh, rather than run it out to, rather than put it at the base of the beam. Hmm. I had not they had to do that just to get it to function at all. <laughs> now, if I, I I was unfamiliar with this project, but once again, it's an example of if I mean if that if, if that's what started the idea is uh, science fiction often leading to science fact. Uh, well, we have door we have op we have doors that open side to side because because Star Trek. <laughs> uh, some the the flip phone concept, yeah, somebody stole that from Gene Roddenberry, and Gene Roddenberry said, "Ah, fuck it." <laughs> Yeah, that tablet. Don't even make flip phones anymore. I mean, seriously. You know, I think uh, I think a better alternative, in all actuality, to any sort of a laser cutting sword or plasma electromagnetic field contained sword, can we make a sword that's effectively a short burst water jet? That Ooh. would actually work. I it's think a, that's actually that's more water. practical to uh, try and create a saber that's. A water jet like cutting machine hmm. that fits in the palm of your hand. Which that, would that's still require a large heavy backpack full of water. I uh, was gonna say a fire truck. <laughs> a fire truck heavy because it must be full of garnet. <laughs> I was gonna say a fire that's truck true. with a hose leading to you. <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest with you, steel is perfectly serviceable and it work and it works damn well nearly every time. Absolutely. It does. Low <laughs> failure low failure rate. Low failure rate. Uh, Yes, and Hill is actually correct. <coughs> Even if we could produce a real lightsaber, it wouldn't be used for, useful for anything except a very imprecise cutting implement, and you could not bring that anywhere near any real part of your body. Well, you <laughs> okay. know, if I could cut bread and have it toasted at the same time, then I'm going to run with that idea of the mini lightsaber. Oh, think of the advantage. That's beautiful. That's a great idea. <laughs> You see, the thing is, you could see that's the thing you could do with a proper laser. Yes, well, you could actually, as as with you could both very of those, easily do that with a laser. As with both of those uh, suggestions, keep in mind that the most dangerous item in any house in America is still the bagel. How many cut palms? <laughs> How many visits you know, to I the emergency a, room? I have a I have a plastic object that I use for that. Ah, uh, excellent. I have, well a piece of, I have a piece of plastic. The bagel fits in the piece of plastic, and there's a slot down the side. Saw, 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 done. Big cheater. Oh, bagel done. Big cheater. Or, that's why, that's why I've never bumped into you in the emergency you could room. Do, or you could do it the lazy way, like I usually do, and that is not by the bagel in tech, but by, but by fork split, just like ah, you would your English muffin. Big cheater. All of right. course I'm a big cheater. That's the, <laughs> that's the way the rules work. <laughs> All right, so, and okay, I will do that because it because it actually game works. Whatever works. Okay. Indeed. Well, I think I think we are going to actually have to split this into two shows. With, like I say, with another forty-five years of laser history remaining, and we've only gotten through the first fifteen. Yeah. This might have to wind up being a two-episode show. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't would, count on it being at the rate we're going. I wouldn't count on it being two episodes. Probably a, closer to four. There's a lot of information. The the different there is a lot of information. of information. And even in even in a relatively short recent past, uh, uh, the, how uh, different wavelengths have an affinity for different different functions. Um, uh, the the the, ch the changing the changing landscape of the whole eye surgery thing. Uh, as, oh, yeah. uh, as soon as somebody discovers it, you know, if we use, look, if we use, if we use this wavelength, this happens. Um, this, this is now the best one. <laughs> so yes, you have a lot, you have a lot of material, sir. I, you're not going to be suffering for lack of material. <laughs> Those are art with lasers. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, right. Actually, believe it or not, I find myself forced, being forced to agree with Mr. Hufford in this case. Let's see what he Mr. Says. Hoffert has said has said, says the following. I beg to differ, Cy, on the realism scale. The most dangerous thing is some guy with too much imagination, <laughs> a lot of free time, and no morals. <laughs> well okay. said. I, you know, I cannot disagree with this. Well said. If, I can't. 
if, it is if, not possible to disagree with that. If he didn't already have, uh, if he if he didn't already have uh, one of our oven mitts, he would have won one just for that statement. Uh, indeed. So. Yes. All right. Um, uh, which I can't believe I still haven't gotten you my address. I still don't have an oven mitt, and it's my fault. Right, I think of the injury in, uh, from 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 movie night that you suffer just for lack of your protective device there. But, oh yeah, anyway. and I'm pretty sure I might have actually face palmed myself unconscious a couple of times. <laughs> well, I damn, I damn near did. I damn near did a couple of nights ago because I didn't have I didn't have I didn't have appropriate shock absorption. Well, and we're that, not talking. Uh, we're not talking about the oven mitt. I could probably fake that. I'm, oh, I'm, fact hard. I agree. I would love for him to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it, you know what? He would. He would instantly misinterpret everything and make it proof of the flat earth. Well, you know, <laughs> if he wants to sit down and do an experiment with a laser, I would gladly teach him how to make sure it's being done properly. But if he wants to decide that he understands manufacturing tolerances and how to set up an experiment he's, he's allowed to fail interested. as much as he wants he is not interested in whether or not we can help him not fail mm. he's not he just isn't there Agreed. is no way no how and no ma'am that is going to happen um that will not occur yeah. period ever in my lifetime or his hell you hello uh, you were on the panel get me a shipping address anybody on the panel gets one you don't have to win <laughs> I already, anyway. fixed, I, I, I already fixed your little red wagon sigh, and I still I had shock absorption is still going to be a requirement. Ooh. Mm. All right. Uh, like. Let's see. Oh, look. We went, oh, wow. We went over an hour this time. Um, yeah, we're actually a little over. Yeah, we did go a little over an hour. And do, do, we, do we have time for the uh, science for the kitties? Absolutely. All right. All right. We must. Science. No, no, no. We must have time for simple science. Simple that science. All. Okay. All right. Here's a. Uh, and if we do not have time, we must make time. We will make because time. Science for children is good. Time has been made. All right, we're on. Uh, got the video thing running. Do, 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 do. Let me uh, share uh, again. Crypto, do not scare me like that ever again. I will go. call you. I will call you out on a video game stream if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's the sharing, so you guys can see what's going on, as well. I am going to press the shush button. <laughs> all righty <clears throat> now oh hey uh speak to, we mentioned the myths uh there is a theme for each series of videos there's only two up so far uh, and um one is a barometer one's electrometer and uh as this one's going if uh anyone can the first person to guess the theme what what this is all leading to in the public ch in the uh, public chat there will be a winner. How's that? Very awesome. All right, here we go. Uh, this simple science uh, experiment is called fun with convection. It's a very simple experiment, um, quick and easy to do. Uh, great for the younger kids to, uh, to demonstrate convection, and I'm sure you've all seen it before. But here we go. Hello again, and welcome back to Simple Science. Today's project is entitled Fun with Convection. Convection is the movement caused within a fluid, in this case air, by the tendency of hotter and therefore less dense material to rise, and cooler, denser material to sink under the influence of gravity, which consequently results in a transfer of heat. Now for the supplies you'll need to complete this project. First, a wire coat hanger, a paper plate, a sharp pin, a roll of tape, a pair of scissors, and lastly, a pen. All right, let's get building. First, carefully bend the coat hanger into the shape shown. This will be the base of your project. Bend the hooked part at the top of the hanger straight. Unroll a strip of tape about an inch and a half long from the roll of tape. Cut this strip off with your scissors. Lay the pin on the sticky side of the tape. Attach it to the top of the coat hanger and continue to wrap the strip of tape tightly around the pin and coat hanger wire. 
Put this assembly aside, and using your scissors, cut the rim off of the paper plate so you end up with a disc about 6 inches across. Using your pen, draw a circle about the size of a dime as close to the middle of the paper plate as you can. Next, draw a spiral starting from the outside edge and continuing to the circle you drew at the center. Try to keep each section between the lines of the spiral close to the same size. Using your scissors, cut carefully along the line you just drew. You should end up with a spiral that looks like this. Carefully balance the paper spiral on top of the pin. Make sure that the spiral does not touch the coat hanger at any point. If your spiral hangs down too low and touches the base, no problem. Just snip off some of the bottom of the spiral to shorten it. And that's it! Here is what your project should look like at this point. Note that it is sitting on top of a lampshade. Why could this be? The lamp, with an incandescent bulb, will act as a heat source, warming the air around the bulb. Turn on the lamp and wait a minute or two. Air heated by the bulb becomes less dense and rises. This rising air impacts the bottom surface of the spiral, causing it to slip sideways and rotate. The rising warm air produces a vacuum that draws more cool air into the area around the bulb. This air is then heated, and the cycle continues. Well, thank you for joining us in this week's episode of Simple Science. We hope you had fun with this week's project. And we hope we'll see you again next week. And that was it. And uh, let's see. So far in the chat, no direct hits. Factard, you are so close. Just with what's been made so far, everybody. Remember, we've got a barometer, an electrometer, and now we're talking about convection. What is the larger lesson that all of these, there's a few more that are going to be built in, I would, I, I, I could tell you, but you yeah, probably yes. should. But well, no, you nope. and you already got a. I'm pretty on the sure show. that I know, but I don't want yes. to spoil it. Indeed. <clears throat> I, but, I have, I have no questions about what, what, what the general theme is. Indeed. However, I will, I will, I will remain silent, because we want the, we want the chat to be able to win. Indeed. I don't need to win. <laughs> In fact, yes, fact hard was, uh, fact hard was pretty close. And he's uh, getting there. Uh, let's see. We're look at the science behind it. Do, and you know what? Sean, Sean, you lie like a rug. I can go out and buy inc incandescent bulbs right now. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They're still available. And I go down to my local walk walk mart and get one. It wouldn't, or or even a Kmarche, and we can Indeed. just. I uh, I think the idiot might actually be onto something. You know, I am gonna. Oh. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Indeed. That is, uh, that is close. You know what? Uh, if we add those two together, back to and idiot, um, it, it pretty much wraps it up. Should we just, should we just award now? You might, might as well. well. All right. Just, just so that, okay. Yes. <clears throat> the larger theme is basically just going to be weather systems. Uh, that's yep. it. That's it. <clears throat> the, word um, I, the word I was going to use is meteorology. Exactly. But, but that's okay. In, in the video, <laughs> in the video, the term I'm going, I will mention that term, but I will, I will use weather systems because, as you know, it, it's it's targeted for a for a, a much a much younger audience than we have here. <laughs> so, all right, indeed, that makes uh, that makes that makes two winners. Uh, you know what to do. Uh, my email address, uh, the email address uh, for uh, Side Strikes in, is always in the description. Send shipping addresses. You guys win. Uh, all right. Let's get rid of this. Yeah, yes. Andy, I got to say no, I don't, actually, another good Yes. The sad part of it is that I actually came up with this a couple of weeks ago. Because there's only one thing you could be looking at with a barometer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, sure, 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 sure. There's exactly one thing you were looking at with a barometer. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> okay, Sean. <laughs> 
Well, uh, you, Sean, I was thinking you were you were closer to three, but that's okay. Well, Sean, <laughs> Sean, Sean's met me, and he'll attest to the fact that I'm in the same boat as he is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. And uh, Andy, great. I great think a large of number of us are. <laughs> yeah, great choice of topics tonight. Um, it was very interesting, and again, that was an amazing choice of videos to to go over. Um, it was oh, hopefully I can follow it up next weekend with uh, another just as interesting and innovative one. Indeed. Well, you seem to have that skill, and I'm not concerned. I strongly suspect it's going to be another interesting one. You just seem to do that. <laughs> well, you know, I try. <laughs> All right. Um, Always like to make people think a little bit. Very good. Well, if you're not if you're not thinking, you're dying. That's all there is to it. Absolutely. Indeed. All right. Uh, um, oh. Anything else you'd like to cover? Uh, anybody? Anybody in the chat? Um, any questions? Or, or should we uh, wrap? Oh, uh, Jamie. Yes. Hammer, yes. Yes, it is. Uh, every every Sunday, uh, Andy does a show, and um, and it's always it's always quite interesting, and. Uh, Okay, Sean. <laughs> hey, by, by, by can, oh by, man, I should by, have gone to Tennessee for the eclipse with you guys. Oh yeah, by the by, Candy Isle. I strongly suspect Sean's referring to the uh, electronics and computer area. <laughs> That's because he that was talking to be... about. The, if he was talking about the literal Candy Isle, I have to stay away from that too for other reasons. <laughs> uh, but the electronics department. You, my wife has a hard time getting me out of there. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Indeed, that's uh, that's okay. So, uh, Andy, anything else? Right. Or would you like me to uh, to hit the outro? <laughs> uh, not that I can think of now. Like I say, we're going to have to pick this back up. We still have uh, several decades of technology to cover. So, I'm pretty sure this is going to be. A show for a couple more days. I would tend to agree. Uh, <laughs> birthday drones doing just fine, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Thanks, Andy. Great, great show as usual. Um, oh, I'm glad you guys enjoy, it, and thanks everybody for joining us. It's an honor to have you here with us. Very good. And on that note. <laughs>